This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. Before we welcome our guest this hour, I want to thank listeners who wrote to me about my article on gun control, which appeared in USA Today. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with me. I realize that many folks today are now working two and three jobs while taking care of their families and volunteering in their communities. And, well, there's just no time anymore to crack open a newspaper. So it means a lot to me. And I do mean that, that you took time to tell me how you feel about our right to bear certain makes and models of arms. Uh, It's a very important issue, and I want to thank those of you who took the time to weigh in. And speaking of arms, our guest today knows a lot about them. In just a few moments, General Barry McCaffrey will be joining us on the program. But before he does, let me mention that the General is a graduate of West Point, and he earned his graduate degree in civil government from the American University. He continued his postgraduate education at Harvard University, the National Defense University, the United States War College, the Command and General Staff College, and the Defense Language Institute. McCaffrey has led U.S. forces throughout the world, from the Dominican Republic and Vietnam to Operation Desert Storm. I don't have time to tell you about all of the tough assignments the general's been charged with but it's important to note that our nation has seen fit to award mccaffrey the purple heart three times the silver star twice and the distinguished service cross twice at the time of his retirement mccaffrey was the youngest general in the u.s army and his final assignment was as commandant of southcom where he was responsible for u.s military activities in central and south america and what you might not know is that mccaffrey is credited for the 1990 humanitarian operations of over 10,000 Cuban refugees, as well as the creation of the first Human Rights Council and Human Rights Code of Conduct for U.S. Military Joint Command. McCaffrey has served this nation as our representative to NATO, worked as a military instructor, and has been an active member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But many of you remember McCaffrey for his role as drug czar in the Clinton administration, a controversial position he held from 1996 to 2001. Today, the general is a national security and terrorism analyst and popular commentator, as well as a consultant and speaker. It's my great pleasure to welcome to the program a leader who this nation has turned to in times of crisis, General Barry McCaffrey. Welcome to the program, General. Rebecca, good to be with you. As you know, we will soon be completing our withdrawal from Afghanistan. And uh, just recently, President Karzai indicated uh, that the Afghan security forces are ready for the handoff. But there seems to be a different opinion amongst the Afghan civilian population who are worried that the country may devolve into a civil war similar to what happened uh, following the Soviet withdrawal in 1989. How do you see this situation, General? Well, you know, I pay a great deal of attention to it. I've been in and out of Afghanistan and Pakistan over the years since the um, uh, since the U.S. intervention. Um, there's mixed reviews. At the end of the day, though, this situation is a mess. Uh, we spent $400 billion. We've had 20,000 killed and wounded. Uh, the American people have walked away from supporting uh, this uh, war Two-thirds of them uh, don't want continued engagement. Um, I think our allies are headed for the door as rapidly as they can. Uh, so the question arises, in 2014, with uh, ostensibly with U.S. combat forces and other NATO allies out, can a centralized government in Afghanistan hold together with a 300,000 uh, police and, and military force this nation? And... The jury's out. My guess is it devolves into regional conflict, um, exacerbated by uh, by the Pakistanis, the Iranians, and and other neighbors uh, who see their interests involved in it. So you know it's it's a mess. And uh, Karzai's been an utter political disaster. And and yet, just within the last couple of days, Karzai is, says that the uh, Afghan military, the police uh, force there, is ready to uh, have the country handed back. 
Um, it's uh, I've had a couple of sessions with him. He's a very educated, uh, thoughtful, kindly uh, person, you know, a Pashtun uh, from one of the most royal of the Pashtun tribes. Uh, you know, multilingual. He speaks seven languages. He's he's a very impressive uh, guy. Uh, he served certainly in, a, in with great personal courage. He, people try and murder him all the time, but it's almost as if he's delusional. Um, and his his comments, public comments, have so eroded uh, political support for the war, for the continued economic engagement in Afghanistan among the Europeans and the U.S., it's just astonishing. He was just in the U.K. last week. His first interview, uh, the Brits having sustained serious casualties in Afghanistan, his first interview, he says, you know, the security situation in Helmand province, where the Brits were, was better before you people got there. I mean, it's just... Well, that's a slap in the face, isn't it? Oh, my God, you know, and, you know, the notion that the... Afghan police are ready to step forward and run a national police force and village police is, is uh, clearly nonsense. Well, this program's all about facts and trying to bust myths and other propaganda that's out there. Um, and as you point out, uh, I think in one of your um, presentations, that uh, these fights and battles against the Taliban have really increased. I mean, we've had 110 attacks a day in June of 2012, and that's been the most since the war began. Mm-hmm. So why why do we have this feeling that we're withdrawing by 2014, but the, the conflicts with the Taliban seem to be escalating? I mean, how do you reconcile those two facts? Well, I think there's, uh, you know, and I'm very sympathetic to the Obama administration, the challenges they've got. By the way, we did get in there, uh, um, I think appropriately, just a simple matter of retribution following 9-11. 3,000 murdered Americans. The operation was essentially centered in Afghanistan. Uh, The late Osama bin Laden, al-Qaeda. So getting into Afghanistan was understandable. Uh, staying with inadequate forces is less clear as having been a wise course of action. And then the current president uh, did campaign for office in the first election saying Iraq was the wrong war, Afghanistan's the right war, we got to get in there and we're going to muscle the Pakistanis, we're going to set the situation right. I think that that argument was uh, probably shaky, but in we went. Uh, The armed forces has done the best they could, along with the CIA and the State Department and USAID. But it's hard to argue that it's really worked. And so the minute we said we're withdrawing combat forces by 2014, which I think we had to say, I think the president had to say that, the American people have had it with the operation, the minute that was out there in public, all the parties to the dispute said to themselves, how are we going to survive after the Americans withdraw? That's what's going on. It's regional powers, and internally it's an ethnic civil war of the Pashtun trying to, maybe 40% of the population, trying to dominate this mixed mass of Uzbeks, Tajiks, Hazaras, uh, you name it, and, uh, and, and dominate with a sort of jihadist extremist culture of the uh the country so well i think you're absolutely right and the part of it that we also haven't had a chance to talk about is what happens when the u.s pulls its economic contributions out of afghanistan because uh you know the afghan economy has got to be able to stand on its own and those economic pressures once the u.s pulls out of any country i mean once the dollars are not there and the civilian everybody from civilian shopkeepers to maintenance workers and everything are not on the u.s payroll anymore that has a severe effect on uh, on the amount of violence that takes place uh, post u.s occupation. We have to take a short commercial break. When we come back, we're going to be asking the general about some other security issues that we should have our eye on. You're listening to the Costa Report.
Hi, I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli, owner of Caraccioli Cellars. I have to say that every time that I've been by, it has been packed with people. It's more of a social environment. Yeah, it's really kind of a meeting place as well. In Carmel, a lot of people come and taste a flight of wines before they go to dinner. We have a big screen TV in there. We feed all the games that are local and important, and it definitely becomes a meeting place for people. So you must get a lot of first dates there, maybe? You know, we get a lot of first dates, second dates. A lot of times it's couples that do come in, and we see them again after the first time. I can imagine, and I would suggest that if anyone's thinking about a first date, that might be a really nice place to kick it off. One more time now, where is the tasting room located and what are your hours? We're located right in the heart of Carmel by the Sea, right on Dolores between Ocean and 7th. We're open daily from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And on Fridays and Saturdays, we actually open up at 11 and stay open till 10 p.m. and we listened. The new and improved paperback edition of The Watchman's Rattle is now available in bookstores everywhere, including airports across the country. If you've been hemming and hawing about not having time to go online or pick up a copy, well, now you don't have any excuses. Find out why government gridlock, terrorism, epidemic obesity, crime on Wall Street, even problems with education and health care have an evolutionary basis to them. Because when you do, you'll never look at our problems the same way. So pick Pick up the freshly printed paperback edition of The Watchman's Rattle. Don't wait. Do it now. Give yourself a real reason to feel optimistic. That's The Watchman's Rattle, available everywhere you are. God is speaking in your own spiritual language. When you listen, you can hear how to live a happy, healthy, and hope-filled life. Jill Grimes, a practitioner of Christian Science Healing, will give a free talk titled, God is Speaking, Are We Listening? As Jill puts it, God's healing love is contemporary and understandable. It is universal and unconditional, not denominational. It gives you peace. Attend Jill Grimes' talk on Saturday, February 16th at 2 p.m. at First Church of Christ Scientist, 3200 Center Street. Soquel. Turn up your radios and listen to this. The greatest showcase on earth, making business personal, is here. That's right. Thursday, February 21st at the Capitola Mall. Join us from 3.30 to 7 p.m. and take the opportunity to get to know what's new around Santa Cruz County. Your chance to see live demonstrations, beer tasting, Santa Cruz Warriors, home remodeling, new cars, local businesses, and the bomb squad from Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department. Be sure to visit the Gourmet Food and Wine Pavilion, where many of the area's finest restaurants, wineries, and caterers will have delicious samples to share with you. Presented by Valley Yellow Pages, the Santa Cruz Sentinel, KSBW Television, and KSCO and KOMY. Call the Aptos or Capitola Soquel Chambers of Commerce for more information at 688-1467 or 475-6522. Don't forget to join us. Admission is free. This Sunday on Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, we're highlighting California's small local honey producers, a new company connecting you to them. Also, a website that makes travel suggestions based on your life is out with its list of the world's best restaurants, and California dominates the list, plus the art of cooking with a wood-fired oven. Get the latest food, beverage, and travel news Sunday mornings, 8 to 10, live right here on KSEO AM 1080. Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, your lifestyle information source. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is General Barry McCaffrey. And before the break, you were making the point that once the United States withdraws from Afghanistan, it is likely that various factions will resume their conflict in one form or another. So let me ask you this, General. Is the withdrawal premature? And if the president called you today, what advice would you give him to preempt civil war? Well, by the way, I think you, Rebecca, for the break, you made a central point uh, of concern to the American people. If Congress funds our continued engagement in Afghanistan, uh, and by the way, my gut instinct is probably $15 billion a year, um, not really a, a significant amount of money compared to the U.S. engagement. At one point, we were running $10 billion a month burn rate. 
But going forward, if we don't fund the Afghans at a level consistent with maintaining their army and police force, in my judgment, they go under immediately. The Absolutely, because that economy cannot stand on its own. I mean, they're, they're, I don't think anybody's going to debate that point. Right. They don't have oil. They don't have a, you know, a vibrant agricultural system. The copper and the, the iron ore deposits are all future 15 years out. So minus external support, they unravel. Um, and so it's going to be very tough on Congress to maintain the focus once our troops are out. But I don't believe the president had an option but to end active engagement. You know, 12 years of combat, uh, 58,000 killed and wounded during this war on terror so far, Iraq and Afghanistan. So I think he had to put uh, a a definite end date. Now, after the so-called combat forces are out, the question will be, do we stay in there? Do we get a status of forces agreement? from Karzai and this government, without which we will not and should not stay. And then do we stay with a tiny presence, let's say three to 9,000 people, or do we keep 20 or 30,000 so we've got air power, intelligence, special operations, trainers, logistics? Um, I think if, it is, if the answer isn't 20 to 30,000 troops, uh, that, again, the thing is more likely to unravel quickly than not. Um, but there's no real support, either in the Republican or Democratic Party, for a robust continuing engagement in Afghanistan. Which is uh, almost a sentence for civil war. You'd have to say that. Now, let me put one... Well, I mean, we can predict this. They don't have an economy that can stand on its own. They they have a police force that is marginal at this point. We see Taliban conflict increasing. We've set a deadline and we've announced it publicly. I mean, I don't know how many different ways we can, you know, look ahead. One of our great... Uh, benefits of being a human organism is that we can look ahead to the future and see the consequences of our actions. I, I don't know how people can look the other way and pretend like this isn't happening. Well, uh, it, it will go into civil war. It happened after the Soviets pulled out for the same reason. The economy collapsed. The police force wasn't strong enough. I mean, maybe they're a little stronger this time around, but our our own economy is is in the dumper. And, and so, you know, I don't think Congress is real excited to vote them money, but they don't have an economy. And I don't see any bridge being built to bring commercial interests into Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I'm saying is is that, look, at it, if at least we had business interests over there, if, if, if they had something that, you know, even if it was just labor, uh, if they had something to trade with, if, if we had some transitional process where we could help them build up their economy, much like we did in Japan. All right. You know, Japan well, became a tremendous ally because, because following that war, we went in there and we made sure that they had an economy going when we left yeah and we don't have that transition anymore do we well we're about to find out Uh, yeah we are unfortunately you know the iraqis had oil water and an educated elite and access to the sea and almost none of those are prevalent in afghanistan Uh, let me put one one uh sort of the on the other hand, argument on the table. One of the people, and I, I just reached out, I was doing an editorial board for a senior news organization. So I started doing my research again, talking to the people whose judgment I respect. And one of them was a military police battalion commander uh, in Kandahar, PhD from Stanford University, extraordinarily intelligent uh, fourth combat tour uh, officer. And she basically said, No, I don't think they're going to go under. I think the uh, Taliban are rejected, that the city of Kandahar, by the way, that's the center of the the Taliban in the south. Yes. She said the city is bursting with economic vitality. Uh, The suicide bombers all come out of Pakistan. Um, You know, there's streets dedicated to weddings, streets dedicated to decorating cars. Uh, she said the only thing that's not in short supply in the Afghan police and army is courage. 
So she said, no, I... I so I maybe there's a the cultural change that's taken place. Well, I think so. I, you know, I think... But the, we can help. Yeah, I, and I do think that the Afghan people, by the way, they're, they're really attractive people. I, all my trips there, um, they're terrific uh, fighters. They're great businessmen. They're very, even though when they're illiterate, they're great students. They'll mm-hmm. watch what's going on and copy it. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they're, in, and they're sick of the war. There's no question about that. And their culture has not been extremist uh, cruelty, uh, which was what they got out of the Taliban. Really, the problem in Afghanistan, going forward, minus our troop presence, is the country's uh, political culture is layers of mayhem, feuds, and corruption. And how they sort that out, I think that's the major issue. The, the Afghan people basically say the Taliban are hateful, but they bring justice. And the Karzai government is corrupt and incompetent. So that that's the challenge they face going forward. Well, they certainly do. And I, I think you paint a, a very accurate picture. You have shopkeepers that are very industrious, very hardworking. They're no different than families here in the United States that are just worried about their kids going to school and mm-hmm. making a living and potentially buying a home you know, and putting food on the table. I mean, when you go to any country, that's what people are focused on. And then there seems to be a separation between the Karzai government and what's going on on the ground. Uh, And that's not a good thing uh, because it does open the door for the Taliban. You know, know, one of the um, sessions I had in Afghanistan, I sat sat around around a dinner table and there were 15 Afghan expatriates. They had the huge refugee diaspora in Afghanistan after the war against the Soviets and the Civil War. All these expatriates came home with their PhDs from London universities in Australia and Canada and the U.S., and they started uh, incredible enterprises, uh, women's organizations, newspapers, TV stations, industrial activity, you know, a road network appearing A lot of that was Afghan expatriates. Those people now are saying to themselves, can we survive post-2014? And And that is a a valid question, and they should be asking themselves that. And And that's what we've been saying. Get my younger son out of here. Take capital with you. We're leaving in, by 2015. I well, think that's, that, that's so. definitely a sign. Now, we have to take another break. When we come back, I'd like to ask you about another dangerous threat in the Middle East, and that is our situation with Iran. You're listening to the Costa Report. Just about everyone knows that fruits and vegetables are good for our health, but not everyone knows how to build a healthier plate. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, a cookbook author and culinary expert. For each meal, nutrition experts recommend filling half of your plate with fruits and veggies. Whether it's fresh berries with your breakfast cereal, a wrap filled with your favorite roasted vegetables for lunch, or a medley of crunchy veggies for a pre-dinner nibble, Dole provides the freshest and highest quality produce available. When you load up on all the nutritional good stuff, you give your meal an instant boost of color, flavor, and texture, plus vitamins and minerals and fiber everything your body needs to succeed. For nutritional inspiration and to learn more about Dole's fresh, whole, and cut vegetables and a full line of berries, visit Dole.com. With Dole as your partner in health, the possibilities are endless. Visit Dole.com. Ladies, are you tired of fine lines and wrinkles on your face and want to get rid of them? Then let me tell you about the all-natural Esotique Collagen Builder. Esotique is a luxurious anti-wrinkle treatment from Chamonix, guaranteed to give you less fine lines and wrinkles and take years off your appearance. And it works. I've been using Esotique for a couple of months now, and the results are nothing short of amazing. Even my deepest wrinkles are softening, and the fine lines just seem to be fading away. If you've never experienced the amazing luxury of Esotique, here's a simple offer. Call now and get Esotique at half price. That's it. Nothing else to buy. The best wrinkle cream anywhere for half price. Call 800-480-6737, 800-480-6737, and ask for the KSCO Half Price Esotique Special, 800-480-6737, 800-480-6737. 
800 480 Howdy folks, my name is Mickey Phelps and I'm the executive chef of Crown Cafe Deli. It's getting cold outside, so why don't you stop by for a nice warm cup of soup or a nice winter fresh salad? Wow, let me tell you, this winter fresh salad has spring mix, cranberries, blue cheese, and glazed pecans. This is sure to satisfy your needs. Also, don't forget that we have an amazing selection of hot and cold sandwiches. For example, the Brit, which is a roast beef and horseradish. We also offer every sandwich on gluten-free bread. And if you're looking for a nice dinner to go, stop by and get the tri-tip dinner with mashed potatoes and veggies. Crown Cafe is located at the Brown Ranch Marketplace in Capitola, between Bed Bath & Beyond and Trader Joe's. For more information, please call 831-475-5992 or on the web at crowncafecatering.com. The full moon lights the silver rails winding around dark mountains and over steep gorges of jagged rock and one freezing cold rushing black mountain river. I wish there was enough time to describe all of the funny twists and turns that led up to now, but there isn't enough time because there's a ticking clock and the two passengers we care most about don't know anything about it. To see what happens next, visit read.gov to read The Exquisite Corpse, a riveting adventure pieced together by John Sheska, Shannon Hale, Daniel Handler, and other popular authors. Explore new worlds. Read. Brought to you by the Library of Congress and the Ad Council. Tune in to the Sentinel Radio Program Saturday morning at 8 a.m. right here on AM 1080 KSCO. Brought to you by First Church of Christ Scientist Monterey. Come into our Christian Science Community Reading Room and Bookstore and find comfort from the challenges you're facing. We have the resources that will connect you with your God-given substance. Find help now. Our address is 780 Abrego Street in Monterey. Reach out for this help today. Come in and visit or call 831-372-5076. 372-5076. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is General Barry McCaffrey. General, while we're still on the subject of the Middle East, uh, recently former Middle East advisor to Obama, Dennis Ross, along with two deputy security advisors, came forward to say that it is very likely that the U.S. will make a preemptive strike on Iran's nuclear facilities before the end of this year. Uh, to this point, it looks as if uh, diplomatic carrots and sticks have done nothing to slow Iran's pace. Would you agree with that assessment? I sure hope not. <laughs> I tell you, I've been uh, watching this with growing dread. Uh, first of all, there's no uh, – by the way, Dennis Ross is one of the most knowledgeable, astute, balanced people I've met in government. He really understands a region. The question is, what do you do about the Iranians – developing a nuclear capability. That's what they're doing. There's no question they'll get there fairly rapidly. My guess is within three years, they'll have workable nuclear devices. They've already got the delivery systems, Shahab-3 rockets. This is not good for Iran. It's going to increase tension. Uh, it's really a sad outcome. But the Iranians have decided to do that 10 years ago. So they're, they're headed there. And what do we do about it? Right now, we're trying diplomatic and economic and covert tools uh, to dissuade them. The option on the table has always been conventional air power strikes. I personally think this is foolhardy. Uh, unless you went to the Saudis and said, look, we're going to bring a thousand aircraft in. We're going to take six months to do an air campaign against the Iranians and wreck their industrial capacity, I don't believe you can do it with two carrier battle groups. All you're going to do is worsen the situation. Um, and by the way, the Iranians, on the first hour of the first day, are going to close the Persian Gulf. They'll probably go after the Saudi oil transshipment facilities. It'll be a giant mess with incalculable economic consequences. Well, what other so, options do we have? I, I, I mean, according to Ross, what's worrying him is not the development of the program itself. It's the pace that that nothing is slowing down their nuclear ambitions. Nothing. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I think they're going nuclear. They'll achieve their purpose in short order. Uh, tensions will rise. The Sunni Arabs will want to develop a nuclear device to counter the Persian Shia nuclear devices. This is not a good situation. 
Um, but my guess is uh, what we're going to be forced into is two things, one of which we're already doing, trying to develop uh, countering interests in a regional sense where uh, Iran's neighbors, and by the way, that should include the Russians if they had a brain in their heads, they're the ones, uh, along with the, the Saudis, the Gulf Coast states, uh, who are at risk in the, sh- in the short term, meaning 10 years. Um, and then I think the other thing we've got to do is continue, and we're doing this also, to develop a theater ballistic missile countering capability, which we can do. So we can tell the Iranians, you're pouring your life blood into creating these dreadful weapons. Your neighbors are frightened and are going to do the same thing. You're going to be less secure. And, oh, by the way, we're going to counter your efforts with technology. So I think that's probably what we ought to do. Well, I think we might. We're already doing that. And I I think that they see that we made these same kinds of threats to North Korea and we took no action in North Korea. Uh, You know, according to Ross, the the benefit that we have, the the actual leverage that we have is that the Iranian economy looks very similar to the Soviet economy during the Cold War. That if we take these facilities out, it takes a long time to rebuild them and a lot of money. And eventually yeah. you can't keep rebuilding over and over and over again. But that's not what worries me, General. What worries me is that we have such short memories here. We have forgotten that Iran has been buying weapons from North Korea since the 1980s. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when the North Koreans reverse engineered the Soviet Scud missiles and, and started selling them to Iran. And so there is a long and a flourishing relationship between North Korea and Iran. So when Ross was saying, you know, it's likely that before the end of the year, we're going to make a strike on Iran's uh, enrichment facilities, I said, well, look, Iran has two paths to nuclear weapons. They can make or they can buy. Mm. Let's just lay it out that way, just like a regular CEO would. You could make or you can buy. And the fact is, is that the North Koreans, their, their nuclear program is more advanced than Iran's uh, nuclear program. And the, and the Korean economy is so beaten up, they'll sell anything to anybody with money. Well, of course, poor North Korea is a giant gulag. A, uh, it's, one of the mo- it's run by a sociopath. Uh, there's no logic to it. I mean, we, I, I love to look at the maps we per- periodically produce from satellite photography of at night uh, the Korean Peninsula. And you see the clusters of energy and lighting in the south and a darkened north. It's a primitive, ugly, cruel place. They've murdered two million of their own. And they are desperate to get their economy back up and running again. And what they've got to trade is nuclear technology. Well, I don't think they're going to trade it. I think they're going to become a nuclear power. They're counting on... Uh, being uh, such a threat to these economically vibrant societies of South Korea, Japan, uh, that the Chinese will continue supplying them with energy and we and the other neighbors will give them grain. And by the way, I don't think they want to get their economy going so much they want to retain power. Uh, But back to Iran, which is the tougher question. Uh, By the way, if you were going to use military uh, conventional air power, you'd start with North Korea before Iran. Uh, but I, but I, I know. Right Why now, do we have two separate plans? Well, if we're going to take out enrichment facilities, shouldn't we be taking them out in North Korea and Iran at the same time? Shouldn't we just go in there and, and wipe those out? Well, you know, in all cases, you know, when you're entertaining the use of, of uh, military power, you have to say, what's the likely outcome? And, and how confident am I of the outcome? And then you have to decide, What's my purpose? And you have to use every military measure to achieve your purpose. And in the case of Iran, back to that as a more immediate decision the Obama administration got to face to, if you go after their uh, the unclassified figure is 72 known nuclear development sites. And yes. I don't know if that's 72 or 109 and the 72 we think we know about or 20 of them uh, deception plans. But to go after that many hardened targets, you have to take down the air defense system. Uh, You then got to go after the sites, multiple strikes, 
to do that, you have to get the Saudis and probably the Iraqis to agree to base U.S. air power in the region. And the entire time you're conducting this massive air and naval campaign, the Iranians have closed off the Persian Gulf. Uh, It'll be a huge naval battle at close range. They've got primitive naval capability, but very the Iranians have bought very advanced uh, mine warfare devices and very advanced shore to sea uh, missile batteries. So, you know, I just look at that and say, nope. Better we isolate them diplomatically and economically. But we did that with North Korea. What makes us think that all these sticks and carrots that we offered North Korea are going to do anything in Iran? Well, I I don't think they're going to succeed in stopping the nuclear program. It started with that assertion. I think the Iranians are going nuclear. Then we don't have any choice. I I mean, you know, it's sometimes you have to, as you know and you write about, sometimes you have two bad choices. You don't have a good one and a bad one. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I think these are a series of unpalatable options. But as a general rule, I tell people, you know, the military option is always compelling. And it's there. And, you know, we have the most powerful military force in the face of the earth. Uh, But the outcomes are always uncertain. And in this case, we ought to predict there's going to be some real uh, devastating short-term outcomes. So, Is it better to strike with military power or to try and wall them off and wait them out? Well, that's a good question. We have to take another break. When we come back, I'd like to find out whether the greatest threat to U.S. security might be the recent cuts in the defense budget. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli, owner of Caraccioli Cellars. What's the first thing folks say when they walk into your tasting room in downtown Carmel? It's not really a typical tasting room that people expect, especially in Carmel. It's a little bit updated, has a little bit more of a modern feel, but still definitely has that cellar quality and old world touch that Carmel exudes. And it really shows. It's a very sort of romantic and sexy environment. You know, we had a great interior designer and architect, Cy Teller, that brought everything together and delivering something a little bit different than the prototypical tasting room you walk into. And one more time now, where is the tasting room located and what are your hours? We're located right in the heart of Carmel by the Sea, right on Dolores between Ocean and 7th. We're open daily from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And on Fridays and Saturdays, we actually open up at 11 and stay open till 10 p.m. Now here's something to think about. If we're having the same problems in the United States that every other country is struggling with, then are these problems really domestic issues? At what point do we wake up and say, hey, if it's happening to everyone, it means it's happening to our species. That's why I'm asking you to read the Watchman's Rattle, because when you do, you'll see that the very idea that there are domestic and international threats is a myth. All of the problems we face today, problems like unemployment, debt, climate change, terrorism, nuclear proliferation, even the spread of pandemic viruses involve other nations. So please take a moment to pick up the Watchman's Rattle. It's a perspective you'll not find anywhere else, and it offers us solutions you won't find anywhere else. Get the Watchman's Rattle. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. Given what's going on in the world, it's more important than ever to save money. Hello, I'm Scott Bedell from Bedell Nelson Harbor Insurance, your allied agent in Santa Cruz. Bedell Nelson can save you money by packaging your home and auto coverage with Allied. We can even help you save on your vacation rental with Foremost Insurance Group. Give us a call at 426-3700 and ask for a free, no-obligation quote. We are Bedell Nelson Harbor Insurance, and we can save you money because Allied and Nationwide are on your side. 426-3700. Well, 
I'm sure you must have heard this again and again. What would you get if you combined the great taste of that breakfast drink tang along with 187 different vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, enzymes added in the healing properties of green tea? Flowerpowerdrink.com Let me share with you a new tasty treat idea. Take one packet of Polybur's energy drink and pour it into a hot cup of water. That's right, a hot cup. Mmm, tastes delicious, especially in these cold, chilly days. Or instead of a cup of coffee or tea. Flowerpowerdrink.com Long-term sustained energy without the jitters. It helped people lose weight and gave more cellular nutrition than the best multivitamin known to man. Flowerpowerdrink.com The natural energy drink polymers. Try it, you'll like it. Flowerpowerdrink.com Michael Olson's second law of the food chain. The farther we go from the source of our food, the less control we have over what's in our food. Now that so much of our food comes from thousands of miles away, we should all get together Saturday at 9 a.m. as the Food Chain Radio Show tracks down who is putting what in our food. If you have a comment about the second law of the food chain, tell me. Michael Olson, all about it at MetroFarm.com. Now, see you all on KSEO Saturday at 9 a.m. for some What's Eating Grunt Radio on the Food Chain. What day was that? Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is General Barry McCaffrey. So, General, moving along to uh, domestic threats, what about these budget cuts in defense spending? Is this just a matter of getting rid of waste, or have we put our security at risk? Oh, I think um, we're in a shameful period. And it's not, it, it's not just the defense cuts that come out of sequestration. It's also an equal amount out of uh, all the discretionary accounts on, on the you know health and human services and the National Institute of Health and it's just astonishing from a management viewpoint can you imagine a 10 just from the defense budget a 10% cut where you're trying to achieve that annual cut in the last 7 months of the fiscal year but military pay and other pieces to include long term contracts are walled off so suddenly, uh, you know, in one March, in theory, we're about to take a series of absolutely uh, idiotic positions to try and wind down the budget by the end of the year. So what and kinds it, of idiotic things are on the table? Well, I think essentially one of the few places they can make immediate cuts is civilian pay. So all over the armed forces, you know, 2.4 million men and women in the armed forces an equally valuable component of that are 800,000 civilians. And suddenly you're going to tell them, hey, by the way, uh, we're going to have to furlough you 22 days um, for sure. You're going to take a 20% pay cut uh, between now and the end of the year. At a time when we're supposed to be creating jobs. Well, absolutely. And, you know, you can save money on burning fuel. So, the Navy says, well, we're not going to put a second aircraft carrier out in the Indian Ocean in the Middle East. And the, the, what I have concluded, and I've talked to a lot of the congressional uh, people directly, both political parties think there's something to be won by shutting down parts of the government in the short run. I think the Democrats think they're going to uh, ruin the Republicans they may well do it, by the way, out of this. And then the Republicans say, look, we haven't gotten an honest budget out of the president in the last four years. Uh, we've got to go to this sort of nuclear option to force him uh, to be honest about revenue versus expenditure. I, I think it's uh, it's shameful and uh, no good will come of it. But do you think there's a fantasy or... Uh, an, an illusion that there's waste, and if you just say, look at it, it's across the board, you got to reduce the budget 10%, that people will get busy uh, looking for wasteful spending, redundancy, things like that? Uh, uh, you know, first of all, I'm sure that you can pare back the defense budget um, by any amount you want. Um, and when you do that, you're not convinced necessarily that you're going to uh, reduce a whole bunch of waste and abuse, which I'm not, I don't believe is really endemic in any of these federal budgets. 
Uh, but I do think what you ought to do is say, I'm going to redefine what I'm asking the armed forces to do. That's what you got to force yourself to, to, to accomplish. So, so if you take your troops out of Iraq, you, uh, at one point we were spending $12 billion a month in Iraq. Well, if you take your forces out, you, you multiply 12 times 12, and that's the savings. Um, you can well, it's not a complete thing. savings because those forces are still on payroll, whether well, they're in the Iraq operating. or not. Right. No, that was the operating cost. So there was actually enormous savings. Mm -hmm. If you don't want your Navy at sea controlling, mm -hmm. securing the choke points of the world, mm -hmm. you can save a lot of money. So I, my guess is if you want to cut the defense establishment, redefine what you expect out of the national security apparatus. And the same thing for... You know, if you want to substantially reduce entitlement programs, uh, then let's define how we're going to do it. But this kind of sequestration process where you're, you know, go, or the, the debt limit debate in Congress has been asinine. You know, kick the can 90 days down the road. Yeah. What kind of business operates that way? Well, a business that's going out of business <laughs> operates that way. Well, it's not very I think thoughtful, they, they, No, it? no. Uh, that, that's my answer. But he, here's what I really worry about. Um, I think uh, you'd agree with me that any security system has to have some redundancy built into it. I mean, you have to have some backup. And I think there's, a, there's an error that goes on frequently when people are looking for waste. They consider redundancy to be waste. And, and so I'm worried that we're going to cut a little bit too close to the bone. We're going to start eliminating redundant systems. And when you begin to do that, uh, you might get away for, uh, for 90 days. You might get away for 120 days. But, but at, at some point, you've set yourself up. You've, uh, you've created more exposure for yourself to have a cataclysmic failure. I think that's a very sophisticated, smart assessment among others, you could talk about the defense budget. You know, uh, at the end of the day, what you want out of your national security apparatus is you want to deter international mischief. And if forced to respond to international mischief, you want to make sure you can overwhelmingly achieve your objective. So unlike a very efficient business, uh, you're trying to have only an effective defense establishment. There's been way too much talk about $600 hammers, that kind of nonsense. You know, we're running a global air and naval power and a substantial Marine Corps and Army that so far have managed to dominate security challenges. And by the way, it's all going to change. In the coming 20 years, my granddaughter will be a you know, two-star admiral in the Navy 25 years from now. And there'd better be a U.S. Navy and Air Force that are two generations in advance of the People's Republic of China. So, I, again, I, I think you're right on the money. At one point, for example, NATO, uh, we were going to tell the NATO partners, you people do anti-mine warfare uh, with little wooden boats, and we'll do the big warfighting missions. Well, then we got in the Persian Gulf. We had an inadequate U.S. Navy anti-mine capability, and the Europeans wouldn't step up to it, right. except for the Brits, who are always there. Right. Uh, so so some, some of these things that we see as being an opportunity to subcontract or delegate to other countries or even to other uh, independent commercial organizations, they really can't be subcontracted outside of the, the, the U.S. government's own control. We can't give up that expertise, and we can't give up our uh, readiness. And I worry a little bit that there's a misperception that that's somewhat wasteful because there are cheaper ways to do it, or we don't need to do that all the time. And that, that's a concern for me because, as you know, uh, you can increase risk and exposure, as I pointed out earlier, and, and that, is my, that is my real worry with these cuts. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you don't want to make a mistake on national security. You don't want to make a mistake on, uh, by the way, this isn't just the military. When it comes to major threats to the American people, uh, you need a public health system. You've got to have it. You've got to be able to deal with epidemiological challenges to the American people. You need a border patrol that's adequate for the task. 
And you ought to step up and pay the price to make sure we have secure systems in place. We do now. I think we're extremely well uh, protected, whether we're talking about the FBI or the CIA or Border Patrol or, 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 or the Marshal Service or the U.S. Armed Forces. But those institutions, by the way, I think, Rebecca, they're 15-year problems. Uh, what a given administration and Congress do is they put the resources together and the doctrine and the strategy to defend the country 15 years from now. You can't get an F-35 stealth fighter aircraft and field it in two years. You know, these are 15-year programs. So I think the, the current uh, con congressional dispute over uh, taxation and entitlement programs and uh, how do we trick each other into, into um, doing something sensible is a shameful uh, failure of governance. Well, I'll tell you, General, we're in agreement there. And uh, and I it's a sorry state of affairs. And I wish you were in there to, uh, what is it my dad used to say, uh, kick their butts and take names. But I'm using nicer <laughs> words than he used. Uh, I, I'm afraid that's the end of our program today. But before we say goodbye, uh, let me take a moment to thank you for your leadership and our, uh, the service to our nation. Thank you, General McCaffrey. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. You're very impressive. I'm glad I was on the show. Thank you. If your station is leaving us after this first hour, my guest next week was the administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency under President Bush and also the first woman governor of New Jersey, Ms. Christine Todd Whitman, will be with us. Whitman has been on the forefront of the Republican Party where climate change and clean energy are concerned. So don't miss Ms. Christine Todd Whitman next week right here on your favorite weekly news program, the last bastion of partisan free programming. Now stay tuned for the second hour of the Costa Report when we take your calls and find out what's on your mind this week. Hi, I'm Judy Profeta, owner, broker, and active real estate agent of Alon Pinnell Realtors, a locally owned real estate company. We've operated on the peninsula for over 16 years, currently located on the corner of Ocean and Dolores and Unipero between 5th and 6th in downtown Carmel. We serve the Monterey Peninsula, focusing on Carmel, Pebble Beach, and the Carmel Valley. Our firm of about 50 agents represents everything from Carmel Cottages to Pebble Beach Estates and oceanfront properties to Valley Vineyards. We are actually known for our vast inventory of fine properties. Drop by and see us, or better yet, visit our website at apr-carmel.com. That's apr-carmel.com. Or you can give us a call at 831 622 1040 and make sure you tell them Judy sent me. For the last 60 years, Coast Paper and Supply has been serving locals and businesses for all their cleaning and paper supply needs. With an 1,800 square foot showroom and nearly 5,000 products, you'll find everything you're looking for in the way of janitorial supplies, retail and industrial packaging, and disposable food service products for business or home. Not to mention their huge selection of boxes and shipping supplies. Their family owned and operated business is located at 151 Josephine on River Street in Santa Cruz. Call 831-423-3350 or visit Coast Paper Supply Inc.com, a proud member of Think Local First. Hi, Jacoby here, host of Raising the Standards, right here on KFCO Saturdays, 3 to 5 p.m. Tune in and join me, Rachel, my co-host, our buddy Rick, and some of the most interesting folks in the world as we chat and play the best music on the planet. And remember, if at some point during the program you're not offended, well, you're just not listening. Raising the Standards, Saturdays here on KSEO, 3 to 5. From San Jose to Salinas, AM 1080, KSCO Santa Cruz.